Love listening to the Blue Monday podcast? Well, your support is very much appreciated. And for as long as we're producing this podcast, we'll never charge you to listen to us. But if you do want to join others in supporting us financially, you can do just that via the ACAR supporters feature. It's up to you how much or how little you want to give. And there is no regular commitment. Just hit the link in the show description. The money you donate may or may not be put towards Joe Fair's football shirt collection. Terms and conditions apply. Hello and welcome to the Blue Monday podcast, now in our sixth season, looking into the exciting happenings of Ipswich Town Football Club. My name is Richard Woodward and you are tuning into the main podcast show. And on the 19th anniversary of Ipswich's first European tie, coincidentally, um, which had been 19 years after the last time we were in the uh, UEFA Cup, um, hoping to put in or put in another good appearance tonight, Joe Fares. And making his first appearance of the season, and someone who has probably had plenty of vodka in his time, um, Seb Brown. How about that for an intro, guys? I've been working on that all afternoon. Um, Joe, how are you, first off? Yeah, good. I've had a good day. Um, finished off with a Nando's, and I've got a quiz question for the pod of which ITFC player came in and picked up a takeaway Nando's while I was in there. Okay. Are you going to give us any clues at all? Um, he's one of my guys that I would describe as lit, so I'd imagine he's would have his with very hot. Oh, okay, okay. I, I, I've I've seen a bit of Alan Judge around the town, so he would be my natural pick. But you're going to say the um, Ransom's Euro Park one, if that. Ah, uh, okay, well. fine. Okay, um, and um, Seb, any any thoughts on who the Phantom and those guys? And also, I'd, welcome back I'd, to the pod. Thank you. I'd, I'd assume somebody a bit younger, so I'm going to guess somebody like. Uh... Uh, Jack Lancaster or someone. Oh, that's a good shout. That's a good shout. To be well, revealed at the end of the pod. God, there you go. <laughs> I was going to say tweet in your answers, but it'll be too late by then. Um, but that's something to be excited about. Um, and yeah, um, uh, 19th anniversary of Ipswich 1, Torpedo Moscow 1. I've stuck the full game um, on YouTube, um, available on my Twitter. Um, get in there before um, some fastidious member of the BBC archives department makes a copyright claim <laughs> against makes me take it down. Um, but it's not posted for profit, so... Um, um, fill your boots. Um, do you guys remember that game? Whereabouts in the ground you were sat and all that kind of stuff? Good night, wasn't it? Yeah, no, I, I, it was, I was behind the, the sort of the BBC box in the middle tier of the Pioneer stand or Britannia stand as it probably was at that point. So I was there so I could see Gary Lineker in there and that. And it was because a massive thing had been made about our unbeaten home record in Europe, wasn't it? It took quite a yes. late goal, if I remember, from Titus to yeah. to save that record and then... We went away and they missed a sitter and Finidi. I can't remember. Um, I couldn't remember Marcus Stewart missing a penalty, but he, he missed a penalty in that match. Similar to the Birmingham City miss, actually. But Seb, you wouldn't have been too far away. Your, your season two. No, yeah. Was, yeah. I was just down from, um, just down from the, um, the, the, the control room. Uh, so I was directly in line when Bramble sort of fired it home. In the, it must have been gone 80 minutes that we, that we equalised, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, it was just great, wasn't it, seeing, seeing us play in, in Europe again and the games that came. You know, I, was, I was fortunate to go to Helsingborg and I'm guessing you guys, one of you guys probably went to Inter or something. It was, a, it was a great time, wasn't it? Yeah, who would have thought 19 years on we'd have been playing in League One? Um, let's have you still it. got the coat? Have I still got the, my <laughs> cream coat? Um, I thought you I, might wear it tonight as a, as a tribute. I don't... I think that might still be around somewhere in my parents' house. So really? next time... You can I, still get... Um, yeah, you can still find it. Sergio Giorgini. So, um, yeah, if it still exists, I don't think we binned it, um, then I will I will do a photo in it. Um, that's for anyone who's um, watched the clip of, um, or I, I did a little screen grab, but if you watch the video, there's a, um, I make a cameo. They zoom in at the end on me applauding the players off the pitch. My dad doesn't give a crap. My dad was not impressed. It takes more to get a, an applause out of my old man. Um, but yeah, there you go. That was a nice cameo for me. Um, Let's move on to more modern times and um, um, <laughs> more petty things. Um, injuries, guys. I've I've got a real bee in my bonnet about our injuries. Um, and possibly, maybe I'm being a little bit harsh about it because I think Lambert's made a, a case that coming back from lockdown and, and kind of getting back into training and stuff, these kind of things were, were likely. But this is just like dominoes, isn't it? The latest is Aaron Drynan, who 
who said, who claimed after the game last week that he could have played on for the second half and Lambert withdrew him as a precaution. He's now out for two months. Um, and I guess, Joe, I, I, we're, we're going to talk a bit about the strikers later on. Um, but A, how annoying is it that it's never kind of a week or two weeks for us. It's seemingly two months and this will end up being three. Um, and more significantly, how frustrating must this be for Drynham? Yeah, um, a player that nobody would have expected to have come in and even be a worry that he was injured. If he was injured, <laughs> if if someone said in June, oh, Drynham's going to be injured for two months, like, okay, who's going to play up front for the under-23s then? Or which loan is that going to scupper? But it's sort of testament to how well that he's done, that he's come in and he's now missed in, in the squad. And again, the injuries, um, I saw somebody post a team that, and without a keeper, we could name a whole outfield 11 of injured players like Vincent Young at right back, Nydam at left back, Wolfenden and Indaba Scoos, in the middle, yeah. Scoos, El Mazzuni, I haven't, don't know all off the Jackson. Like I say you've, you've got a whole team of injured players there and it just seems like it's always the case. We have so many injuries and it's always the case that players are coming back from injury, but they never actually get back and they cut, oh, they're going to be out for two months. And then all of a sudden it's eight months. Vincent Young, he, he was yeah. injured, come back in, doesn't play, misses a game, straight back out. Oh, he needs an operation. He'll be out for two months. And then the season ends. We haven't seen him. The season starts. He plays a couple of pre-season games. And I'd say he hasn't played since Spurs. That's probably yeah. four or five weeks ago now, yeah. isn't it? And James Norwood has, has an operation at the end of last year or sort of February. And it's now September and he's still miles off it at the moment. And it just seems that we don't seem to because teams will get injuries and it can be down to conditioning or the players not looking after themselves properly I think like Toto's injury in pre-season last year was him not stretching properly and him not warming up properly but it's it just seems we can never get players back within the, within the time scales that they're that they're due back in and like I say I sort of pulled up a quote from when Adam Webster signed for because obviously we had these issues with Adam Webster David McGoldrick players that we couldn't keep fit that then went elsewhere and play every week and Lee Johnson commented in The Athletic on a piece of Adam Webster saying we liked him for a long time he'd had a bit of an indifferent year in terms of injuries and we'd heard it maybe wasn't the best at Ipswich then in terms of sports science and I know under Mick he was not big on sports science Paul Hurst came in and said we need to sort this out and he brought in Nathan Winder from Barnsley, who's now at Sheffield United Sheffield as their United, head of yeah. sports science. And obviously, <laughs> they're, they're a team. And I think at one point last year, like eight or nine of their squad had played all bar sort of three or four games over the last two seasons. They were doing that. So they, they can keep players fit, but we just don't seem to be able to. And it's, is it just, we're st it's getting better, but we're still playing catch up. Is it that we look so much at our own squad that we sort of, we don't realise that other clubs have these problems. Because I remember like playing Preston a couple of years ago and they had so many yeah. injuries that they had in defence, they had to play sort of two debutants and things like that. So it, it might be that we just focused so heavily, but it, it does seem that there is something wrong when players get injured, how long they take to get back fit. Yeah, the, the next one is um, is Alan Judge, um, Seb. And, and um, Lambert said he picked up um, an, an injury on, on Wednesday night. Um, what's he said hopefully next week he'll be okay it's his hamstring but it's not serious hopefully it's not too bad but he did say Caden Jackson and I think Jackson tweeted a picture of him returning to training yeah, um, back on the grass hashtag <laughs> yeah, forward to getting back out there and stuff yeah God, I love that um, but I guess um, at least an injury for Judge doesn't sound too serious but not in a position where you know we, we, we're not missing too many we've got sorry plenty of options in those wide positions but um your thoughts on kind of drying in and more where does Jackson fit in I guess well Jackson I think is going to struggle to, to play Lambert clearly doesn't rate him through the middle as the as the lone striker and he's, he's never seemed to fancy him as one of the wide forwards so I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to see where he'll fit in you assume that if a, if an offer is made from from you know there was the rumor of the Birmingham bid the Bournemouth bid if, a, if an offer is made and it's suitable I guess we will accept it and move on because in those wide forward positions with Sears and Lancaster coming back after yesterday we are fairly fairly well well stocked um, going back to what Joe was saying about the sports science and Hurst, I, I often go on the TWTD on this day feature. And it was two years ago yesterday where Hurst said, you know, the things I'm putting in place here with sports science will massively help the club even after I've left. 
So I don't know if as soon as he left, we just threw it all out the window and didn't keep any any remnants of his reign going. But uh, it's like Joe said, it's so frustrating when, you know, Dryden, for example, has a really good preseason, starts the season really well, really, really crucial to the way we're looking to play this year. Suddenly, you know, oh, yeah, he's out for two months. And, and like Joe said, you know, I don't think we'll see him before before Christmas. Two months will become three. Uh, hopefully we'll see him ASAP, but I'm, I'm not confident. Hurst, Hurst bought those GPS tracking vests that we wear now. So that's, yes, that's, that's yeah, the legacy, that. you know. I kept that, brilliant. It's basically a glorified Fitbit, isn't it? Let's be honest. But I think we were one of the only teams in the Football League that didn't have them at the time. Exactly right, yeah, yeah. Um, let's move on from injuries. I, I, we, there's plenty in the questions about the strikers. I wouldn't mind seeing Jackson have a go down the centre, but um, it'd be interesting to get your thoughts on that maybe later on. Um, just kind of rounds up in results. Um, Joe, you did the um, post-match live stream with Ben midweek after the Fulham defeat in the Carabao Cup. Um, seven changes in, in that one. Just Seb, let's quick, just quickly your thoughts on that one and, and maybe what it means in terms of maybe not so many Tuesday night fixtures and all that kind of stuff. You're, you, are you disappointed to be out of the Carabao Cup? No, not really, because we would have to play it again this coming this coming Tuesday. So I think they could do with a with a free week to get some to get some you know bodies back, hopefully out the treatment room, and hopefully put you know a decent week of a decent week of training. I think it is what it what it was. You know, we got some minutes in the in the likes of Norwood and Hawkins. Kenlock came in. Downs made his uh, made his uh, reappearance. So it was a, a useful exercise. But I'm I'm certainly not bothered about going out with the with the fixture congestion being what it is. And we didn't get thumped three 0 which I think was my prediction as well. So. Um... I was going to say a confidence booster, but at least we saved a bit of face by not getting dicked by Fulham, um, who had an interesting day yesterday, didn't they, away in Leeds? Um, and rounding up the kind of results, um, the ITFC women's team kicked off their season proper today with a 1-0 victory over Hashtag, hashtag United, um, formerly the Basildon, Basildon Ladies, I think. Um, Lucy Egan with a, a volley that sounds quite good, so worth a watch out there. Um, and they'll presumably be looking, guys, to... Um, their season was cancelled, wasn't it? No points per game for them, and they'd they'd be down having a stormer. So presumably looking to pick up where they left off and get that. World yeah, I, I speak to Kieran, who does all the press for the ladies' team, a bit, and I think hashtag United, even as ridiculous as they sound, picked up from Basildon, who were one of the better teams in the league last year, and so this was seen as sort of a tough game to start the season with. So to get off yeah. with a one 0 win after after all this time about a game is a really good start for the ladies, and hopefully they can get the promotion that they deserved last season because they should be in the league above because they had such a good year last year, and it was so unfortunate how it turned out. So fingers crossed the ladies get up this season. Yeah, here, here. Um, let's bring things right up to date. Then let's go to uh, the Memorial Ground in Bristol. Um, Bristol Rovers off the back of an opening day away draw at Sunderland, which I think on paper looks decent. Um, 80 minutes they had the lead for and conceded, um, I think it was the 82nd or 83rd minute, but 28% possession. Um, we obviously have recent experience of defeating them in the Carabao Cup. Um, so I, I guess I think a lot of people were expecting um, Ipswich to be the favourites, but know that Bristol Rovers, particularly after least last weekend, um, can contain teams and probably we're looking for a little bit of early revenge um, from the defeat at Portman Road. Um, let's just start with them. There's a, there's a few changes from the Carabao Cup win for us. Um, they're still playing three at the back, but I think they've now signed a striker. I think they have one up front um, when they played us at Portman Road. Um, they now have two. They have signed um, Brandon Hanlon from Gillingham um, and he came in for Hargreaves. Ed Upson, former town youth um, and the winner, they scored the winning goal on the Youth Cup final, of course, um, came in for Nicholson, Harris for Baldwin, and uh, Yakola in, um, comes in goal for Van Stoppers, Stoppershirf. Yeah, we'll go with that. Close um, enough. I read that about five times about three hours ago and had it down, and I've completely forgotten all about it. Van Stoppershirf. Yeah, we'll go with that. Um, Ipswich, then. Um, we know about Drynan. Um, Norwood comes in for him. Um, we now know about Judge. Edwards comes in for him. I think those are the only two changes, guys. I'm looking through. I think otherwise we're pretty consistent with the lineup from last weekend. Um, interesting news on the bench, though. Lancaster is back from his concussion, um, and he will come off um, the bench, spoiler alert, to make his first appearance since the 2-0 away defeat at Blackburn in the 19th of January 2019. Um, Lambert's been talking about two years, not quite two years, but close. And Flynn Downs, time. exactly right. All is... Seemingly forgiven for Flynn Downs, um, Lambert a bit more contrite in his post-match press conference after Downs came off the bench. Um, or did he play against Fulham? 
I think he came off, he came the, off bench. the bench. Yeah, he came um, off the bench. Yeah. And um, yeah, and uh, similarly, second half coming for him here. Um, guys, I guess uh, we, we can talk about the specific bits of action here. Um, I, I guess my my main question to you here is the difference between the first half and the second half. Um, I think generally the possession was quite consistent. I pulled the numbers. 56% possession in the first half, 55% possession in the second. Um, but we've almost doubled our chances, particularly the shots on target. Um, there's not much to talk about in the first half. Sears has a free kick, I think. We were all kind of chipping in on the fabled Blue Monday WhatsApp group that he's going to float this one over the bar. But... Decent effort round the round the post, or sorry, round the wall, and saved by the keeper and um, Edwards and Chambers can't make much of it. But otherwise, it's it's Bristol Rovers who have I think the more clear cut chance. It's Hanlon in absolute acres after about ten minutes and probably offside and just side puts it highly. But what was the what was the story of the first half for you guys? Because it it just didn't feel particularly um, fluid, did it? Our, our passing play and I'm not sure Dizel Bishop certainly didn't really feature much. Do you put that down to Bristol Rovers, or is that a little bit of rustiness for us? I don't know. Any, who... I, th- I think they were quite happy to sort of stop, just just trying to stifle the game. In the first, I thought the first ten minutes we started quite brightly, 10, 15 minutes, and we were getting in down the flanks quite often, but weren't able to put a decent decent crossover, or we didn't really have enough men in the box either. And they seemed they seemed to play like this strange midfield where they seemed to have two holding midfielders and two. Central midfielder sitting in front of them, and, and like the box, the Coventry box, yeah, or whatever, the, the Coventry yeah. box, yeah, and, and they were just, it was just so clogged up in the middle. It also looked quite a windy day. There's a lot of passes. Seem the side where the camera was on, the ball seemed to fly out of touch by about ten yards from both keepers and both halves. So it, it looked like there was a real sort of heavy wind there, which makes passing it about. But Dizel was being man marked. He he struggled to get into the game, and it just really was a. We we kept trying to do the right things, but we just weren't really getting anywhere with it. We were, Seb, I, we, Holy, um, Joe's mentioned the win and stuff. Holy's, Holy's goal kicks, um, he, he absolutely launches it, doesn't he? And I'm, I'm, we didn't play it out from the back too much. There was a few times where we rolled it out and we tried to play it out, but was the distribution, it, we talked about pre-season, or certainly I've talked about in the pre-season, that if we don't have the personnel to do it, we shouldn't do it. Um, and we didn't do it yesterday, and maybe that was that was stopping us from retaining the ball and making things happen. Was that a factor? Yeah, potentially, because the first couple of games of the season we were playing it short, and they were finding Dizel, you know, with the with the second pass, and then he's got his foot on the ball, and he can start to dictate play. Yesterday, we were noticeably Holy was going was going longer. Um, I guess without without Wolfenden in that back line. Um, you're going to be a bit jittery when you're when you're rolling it out to the likes of Nciala and Wilson. So potentially without him, that might be a factor. The conditions, the wind might be a factor. But Dizel just didn't really get his get his foot on the ball. He was like Joe said, he was man marked. He was struggling to find pockets of space, and I think that just led to our our game plan being sort of you know every now and again hoof it and hope that Norwood could hold it up for a little bit to get the runners in and around him. The other the other thing I noticed yesterday was that Warden Sears was quite a good. Again, we used the kind of Harry from Bath Covalent Bonds thing for Warden Sears, but they they didn't really get into the game yesterday either, did they? Ward particularly, I think, was quite quiet yesterday. I, was that was that just a coincidence or? Was there any... Well, in, in in the first half, I thought Ward, Chambers and Bishop were playing deeper than they did in the first game of the season. Second half, they, they started to push up. But I think in the in the first half, the fullbacks weren't weren't bumming on quite as much as they were in the first week. And Bishop seemed to be noticeably deeper as well. Um, so I, I, I don't know if that's a, a, a you know a, a tactic that Lambert was employing, given that they try and stagnate teams like they did up at Sunderland in the uh, the previous weekend. But I, I thought that was noticeable in the first half. And that's really what we struggled to get going. Yeah, they they looked like they'd push their wide men further forward, and it just to sort of sit Chambers and Ward back deeper, and it, that seemed a deliberate ploy from sort of Bristol Rovers to try and stop us playing out that way and pushing our fullbacks on. The the, the threat again against us is set pieces. We talked about it with Obi last week. Um, Westbrook it is ex Cov, um, who has two free kicks which he arrows to the far post, and both times. Um, it's Kilgore, Kilgore, I think, the first time who tries to lunge in with a diving header and doesn't really make contact in Hannon in the second half. But suddenly, guys, Ipswich kind of click into gear second half. Um, there's kind of a, a yeah, a, an early kind of warning sign and, 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 and the emergence of Nolan, which we will talk about in a sec as well, um, who kind of cuts through the middle, plays in Edwards, and it's kind of low shot. It's quite easily saved by Yakola. But it, it, does this all pivot the second half on the, the double, where well, the substitutions all kind of 
come around the 65th minute. And does this change things? It's, it's Lancaster for Sears, who, as we said, had the free kick, but didn't really do much. Hawkins for Norwood, who, again, didn't really do much. I'll pick you. I'll, I'll give you Norwood stats. In fact, naught shots, one blocked shot, three offsides, including one yellow card for descent for that offside. Only 17 touches. Um, it's kind of 50% on his ground and aerial duels. It, it wasn't a great day for Sears. It wasn't a great day for Norwood. Bishop is also withdrawn and, and um, Downs comes on for him. Is it this substitution, this kind of, it was one and then two substitutions, does this change the fixture for you? I, I think we'd started, we'd, we had started to get on top just before the subs and there's a couple of tweaks, like the centre-backs were going wide to take the ball from Holy. Not that it always went there, but it just that just freed up bigger area for Dazelle to try and play in in front of there. So we were starting to get Dazelle on the ball a bit more. Bishop was starting to come into the game a bit more because he'd been totally anonymous in the first half. And But when when the subs were made, Lancaster just gave us a little bit more sort of X factor on that wing. He'd sort of trying to do a bit more where Sears had been just quite easily managed all game. And I think the key sub was sort of downs coming on because that allowed John Nolan to push up sort of into the area as the sort of further most forward of the three midfields and he was able to just keep sort of keep picking the ball up and keep getting onto it and he was really really making things tick but it seemed like having downs in there just flying about really competing enabled Nolan just so much more space and he was really really good with that space yesterday he was yeah in 71 minutes Nolan um this I mean this is an amazing pass. He he's kind of picks the ball up deep, kind of deep into the well near the halfway line, really, just inside the Bristol Rovers half. And Seb, this is kind of right onto the kind of into the feet of Edwards. He takes it around the keeper, who kind of comes out. And sadly, he just got, he, I think he needs a bit. He wants a bit more time, Edwards, and he doesn't get it. And his shot's a bit tame, and it's I think it's cleared off the line by a little. Um, but where where's this Nolan come from? You know, who can ping these passes through? I mean. This is a, a total resurgence from him, isn't it? Yeah, it was absolutely superb, wasn't it? And he, as the game went on, he grew and grew. I think fitness played a, a big part in the second half as well. We all saw Nolan's times during lockdown for his his runs and stuff. And as the game went on, he seemed to get fitter and fitter. And the whole team did. I think there was a, a noticeable difference in the fitness levels between ourselves and uh, and Bristol. But but Nolan was superb. You know, like, like Joe said, Downs coming on freed him up a little bit to make those runs forward in support of. Hawkins and the and the two wide men. He wasn't really playing as a number ten, but more like a you know a number eight. He was he was doing the box to box stuff a little bit more, and um, that pass was superb. And his his influence really really started to grow on the game. We'll talk about his goal in a, in a second, but um, Joe, I just want to get your thoughts on Jack Lancaster. He, he came on, I think he nearly had a chance straight away, didn't he, with his first touch? Um, yeah. But a kind of a nice move, with a little bit of stuff with Dizel, uh down the right hand side. Chambers, I think, involved as well, and. Um, you know, a great kind of welcome back for Lancaster. And I mean, what's going on with Yakola and Aimer here? This is this is a calamitous defending, isn't it? Yeah, it just well. That, but again, we were talking about how it had been a really windy a windy day. It looked, and I think that must play into this because the ball's swirling around there, and he's he's trying to get there. But just on Jack Lancaster, like just great to see him back because he was one of the few highlights of that eighteen nineteen relegation season. He he came in and looked sort of at it straight away he, he held no respect for the players he was up against I remember sort of away at Stoke and he's just bullying his way through full backs and he just I don't know he just seems to have that attitude and that swagger that just he has the confidence to try things and he has a great all the it seems all the academy boys that come through they have a lovely link up together with sort of Dazelle, Downs, Bishop, Lancaster even Wolfie sort of they've all played together for so long especially the sort of Wolfie, Dazelle, Downs and Lancaster. They've, they've, they've played together for years and years from when they're sort of eight, nine, ten years old. And they, they just seem to be all on each other's wavelength and just some lovely football. And I'd say just, just for Jack to come back and basically to get two assists. I don't know, does it count as an assist for an own goal? Or but he came in so, and but... he, he, he comes in, puts a cross in that I'd, I wouldn't say forces the own goal because that's probably putting a little bit too much um, sort of quality on it because it, it didn't really but he caused confusion he got the ball in early and that's that's just what he does he, he tries things and sometimes they don't work and sometimes they do work but having that confidence and ability to try things is really key am I right that he's beefed up a bit he, he looks a bit chunkier in a good way I mean I, I, ha- I haven't um, checked his bicep and <laughs> bicep measurements <laughs> since you haven't got your four he, so. he, he does look a bit bulkier yes yeah yeah um, 
and and yeah, I think this. I think the keeper here is is a fault for this one. I I, I assume he doesn't shout and Aimer tries to take things into his own hands and um, just makes the mistake and heads it in at the near post. Um, and and there's there's a. I mean, this is a real key chance here. Eighty two, um, and and another kind of example of getting crosses in and and maybe this is where Hawkins is better as a as a focal point Seb for. Um, for these, the, the Norwood. It's a lovely move. I think, I think Dizel again is really involved here. I think it's his cross and yeah. Hawkins should score this, shouldn't he? Yeah, the build-up is superb. You know, the one-touch stuff, Dizel breaking breaking on, lovely ball in and Hawkins, you, you know, he's got to score that. You know, he's, he's coming back up to fitness but that, that kind of charge, you, you've got to score that. But the, the build-up play to that was superb. If you'd have scored that, that would have been an outstanding team goal. It was really, really good slick interchange, lovely ball in and a, a really good chance. And, and, and Seb, we... We're used to Ipswich taking the lead and sitting back a little bit. And apart from conceding, I think, a set piece, we kept going, didn't we? We didn't let them kind of come back into the game too much. Yeah, and again, I think that comes down to the fitness levels. Uh, I think, we, like I said earlier, we, we noticeably looked fitter in the second half of the uh, of the game than they did. We grew into it. We kept going. We we didn't start hoofing it long. You know, I guess the temptation with Hawkins on would be to go long and make him hold the ball up. But we were still doing the little little passing triangles in midfield between Downs, Dizel, and uh, and Nolan, and um, and yet we restricted them nicely. And I thought we played out for a a one nil, which had been fully deserved. But obviously, as we as we kept going, we got our rewards with the second goal. Mm. Nolan has 70 minutes. Nolan has a shot that deflects into the side netting, but he's going to get a goal on 89. Um, and it's Lancaster actually who's breaking things down. And and this is if you watch back, I think both of you said this point, particularly you, Seb. I think this is where Bristol Rovers are looking tired because this is yeah. just lazy possession. They keep dropping deeper and deeper and deeper. Lancaster kind of pounces on a loose pass, plays it to Nolan, and and who wants to talk us through this one? I mean, this is this is kind of. I was about to say Messi-esque, but I'm not gonna. Joe, do you want to talk us through this one again? Yeah, yeah. Like I say, I think the the point about them tiring is that must be in some ways to do with how we're passing the mm-hmm. ball about and dominating possession and just keeping them running and running and running, chasing us around. That the players they they just can't do that all game. And bear in mind, we'd had a midweek game. I know not all the same players have played, but we'd had a midweek game where they they had it. They'd had a extra rest. They'd had an extra day anyway because we played on a Sunday and. Just by keeping the ball, this is what happens to to the good teams that do keep the ball. The the opposition sort of seeds and sort of folds towards the end of it. But this was just a nice little sort of break up a play by Lancaster, and he just he rolls it into Nolan's path. I know it's a it's a simple assist, but he rolls it into him. Nolan doesn't need to break stride; he just fronts up the centre back, just shifts it onto his left foot, and just. Um, drags it back across the keeper and into the bottom corner. It seemed almost in slow motion, but a, t- a tidy finish. A low bobbler is, is what I've written down here, but um, but well deserved on, on on that performance, particularly in the second half. Uh, Seb, uh, how does how does Nolan go from and and I'm going to lump Enciala in, in this as well. Go from someone that a lot of people were thinking might be surplus this season because of the abundance of central midfielders we've got. And the NCR obviously went out to loan to Bolton and, and no one thought he was coming back. What what changes to, for these players to suddenly, to, apart from a bit of an injury crisis, but what stops, what's, what's caused these players to suddenly become so so critical and, and for Nolan to be playing with such confidence? I guess that, that is the word, confidence. You know, Lambert said when NCR went to Bolton, I think he said he needs to get out. You know, he needs this fresh break. He was getting hammered on social media. I, I'm guessing playing with no crowd might help a little bit as well. Toto in particular used to, mm-hmm. you know, noticeably go into his shell a little bit when the North Stand would start groaning if he, you know, shanked one into touch or made a bad decision or or dived in on a uh, on a foul. But um, they've, they've become crucial to, to the team now, and it gets to the point where you think maybe you know they're going to be the, the sort of one of the first names on the uh, on the team sheet. I'm guessing with, with Nolan, maybe having the likes of Bishop, uh, Dizel uh, around him, they're they're quicker players than the likes of Scoos, who, who he's played with in the past. So you know he's got that 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 freedom and that flexibility a little bit to play the quick uh, the quick passing because he's got guys around him that can deal with that better than somebody who puts their foot on the ball and tries to slow the play down a little bit. Um, but he's, he's, he's at the start of the season, I thought Nolan might well go. I thought Enciala wouldn't wouldn't come back from the loan from from Bolton. I thought we wouldn't see him again. And the fair play where credit where credit's due, they're doing really really well. I was, I was gonna throw the word scoose in. Um... Only because if I don't, it will come up on the Twitter questions yeah. eventually. Um, and and we've had this before, haven't we? We're kind of, I wouldn't call it a false storm, but kind of moments where Scoose's absence perhaps highlights that 
you know, this is a midfield that where creativity is possible and 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 maybe his his presence is detrimental to that. I don't know. Maybe I'm being harsh, but well, we're moving the ball noticeably a lot, lot quicker this season, aren't we? You know, it's one touch passing, it's passing triangles and movement. When Scoos is in the team, I, I'm, a, I'm a Scoos fan. I think I was glad he stayed around the club. I think he's vital for the stuff he does with the uh, with the coaching of the academy and stuff. But he, he does have a tendency to put his foot on the ball a little bit and slow play down a little bit. I guess when you've got you know younger players around you who can maybe last a little bit longer in terms of the legs, um, it makes it makes Nolan in this in this instance his job just a little bit easier. Mm. I think Nolan was probably the player most guilty of slowing the ball down last season, though, Sideways and do, doing though, it in yeah. more attacking positions. Just, but he seems, he seems to be a player that last season played with a lot of fear, um, not wanting to make a mistake, so then taking the easy option, and it became more noticeable because he was the midfielder in the most attacking position. He'd often be the one that landed on the ball in the key position, and then he'd go safe and slow it down, but whatever reason the shackle seems to be off him this year and he's got more confidence with that confidence he's starting to look like the player that we thought we were signing when we paid a seven figure fee for him yeah good reminder there of the fee Joe um, let's get into the questions um, let's just quickly on there's, there's kind of a general theme here of questions on um, Bristol Rovers but playing the better teams in the division so let me see if I can um, group these together a little bit let's start with Mullet which um, who asks um, do we credit Rovers for clearly learning from the last game by being much harder to break down and tactically more disciplined or worry that neither striker looked good. Um, Seb, do you want to say that one? Yeah, I mean, uh, they are still getting back to full fitness. You know, Norwood's barely played since, was it, fe- operation was the end of January, I think it was, wasn't it? So you're talking, you know, eight, nine months of no real football. So him and Hawkins are both coming back up to fitness. And he looks like he's <laughs> carried a bit of weight as well still. He does a little bit, yeah. Um, I guess if you follow him on Instagram and stuff, you could see that potentially some of the professionalism might not always be there. But um <laughs> The more minutes he gets in the tank, the better. I still think Norwood is our, our best chance of a goal simply because of his record and the fact he seems to fashion so many chances by himself as proven with the number of shots that he has. Um, but he didn't have any yesterday, stuff. Seb. One block Sorry? shot yesterday for Norwood. Yeah, yeah, he didn't. But like I say, he's working his way to fitness. He doesn't look 100% fit yet. A fit Norwood is, you know, chasing down everything, being a real pest and... Yesterday, I think, come five minutes after half time, I think he was done. I think we all thought Hawkins might come on five, ten minutes earlier. Um, and he just got more and more frustrated with himself that culminated with the with the yellow card for the offside. Yeah. Um, kind of uh, evolving this on to talk about opposition, um, I'll, I'll kind of add questions. We've got questions from the pods team, which um, is always useful, I guess, but we want to maybe um, canvas opinions further and wider than just our own Um but Craig says, um, are we going to score enough goals against the better teams or will our relatively helpful starts of the season allow us to hone tactics and the system further to be clinical by the time we play them? Um, and Thomas Ebling says, based on how we started the season so far and the tactics Lambert is now looking to employ, how do you guys feel we are going to perform when we play any of the main contenders this season? I know, Joe, you've talked about this before. Um, do you think this is a, a firm foundation to build on or do you think, as Craig thinks, that the tactics might need to evolve a little bit when we play someone better? Um, I, I, I think it's a firm foundation to build on in that sort of I know we don't want to keep harking back to last year, but last season when we were winning games at the start of the season, there was a lot of chats on this pod from all of us that, yes, we're winning, but we're not really playing well. We're not creating enough. We're not, we're not positive we're sort enough. of getting Sorry. ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and then we just we're just not we don't, just don't look good value. For, it seems to be moments of sort of individual brilliance or that might be over egging it or sort of poor sort of individual errors from the other team that we, we were able to take advantage of, but we seem to be just better than them because we had better players where this year, I'd say the biggest criticism of us this year, or t- there's probably two criticisms, defending set pieces. We look a bit dodgy and taking chances. Well, you'd, you'd hope that you can become more clinical, but it's it's much worse to not be creating chances at the moment. Like we, even even if you look yesterday, in what was a pretty turgid game that we we struggled in, we struggled to get over the line against a real sort of side that lacked any ambition going forward at all. Edwards has one cleared off the line. Edwards has another good chance that the keeper saves. Hawkins has a header that he has to score. Obviously, we get we get the two goals, and that sort of that two nil could be three nil, four nil, even five nil when you look, when you look at what else happened there and I say we're far from the finished article but ultimately our squad is at a different level to most teams in this league and if we can get some confidence playing a way that is that we beat the bottom teams relatively comfortably which we are 
well, who's to say they'll be bottom teams, but we, we seem to be playing, sort of getting back to where our squad should be playing as opposed to getting the results, but not really looking convincing. Yeah, I know. I, I've been a long, <laughs> outspoken critic of League One, and I just think if we chip and change every time we play someone different or someone who's slightly better than the team we beat, the week before, then I just think it undermines the stuff that we've we suffered from last season, yeah. which was the rotation and the changing of the systems. As well, though, there, there wasn't a huge amount of quality in League One last year, and a lot of the games we lost, you sort of thought... one nils, weren't they? A lot of them. Quite poorly, but it's because we just didn't have any goals in us, where yeah. we do look as though we've got goals in us this season. The strikers are a bit of a worry, because out of the sort of three main ones, Norwood is the one, that, is the one that's going to score us goals if he plays. But... I say it, we're just not creating chances, but the league is going to be worse this year than it was last year. There's the whole COVID thing, which has affected every team from the top to the bottom of the league. There's now a salary cap in place, and it just like the, the relegated teams are all sort of a, a bit of a shambles that have come down. Hull are sort of looking the ones that can turn it around a little bit, but this is going to be a weaker league. And and we as a squad, we haven't we we haven't really weakened as a squad. We've probably stayed the same and now we are actually playing as a team so fingers crossed we do and we've got a pretty easy start to the season like I say we're going to be a good 10-12 games in before we before we start having a run of more difficult games and if we actually can be at the top of the league at the end of that 10-12 games and playing a style creating like I say we've created like 15-16 shots on goal in all three of our games against league one opposition so far so Hopefully someone just hits a hot streak and we start scoring more goals. Yeah, well, James Chidwicks asks, playing the 4-3-3, is there less pressure on the strikers to score, Seb? Do they uh, do they become more like Firmino? Um, goals from wide midfield, um, he says, gutted for joining. But um, is that a help now that there isn't so much pressure and we're seeing C- Sears score, Edwards score? Yeah, I think so. And Lancaster coming off the bench and having an influence and, you know, God forbid, the midfield might have been with a fair few goals this year. Um, if Nolan gets this, continues his, his, his run of form and his, his confidence and can be that, you know, that box to box, you know, that, that finish that we, we thought we bought in uh, in 2018. There's no reason the goals can't be shared out more, which takes some of the emphasis off the uh, off the, the focal point. And Seb, and a question from ITFC Analytics. Um, who would you all pick as the starting wingers in the 4-3-3? Sears the biggest goal scorer, but isn't involved too much in the build-up. Judge the complete opposite. Lancaster, a combination of the two, and Edwards, a different option for us. Um, who would be your, uh, I guess, am I going to caveat this with saying ignoring injuries? Yeah, I will. Who's your yeah, first assuming, pick? Every, assuming everyone's fit, I'd go Sears and Lancaster playing as almost like, you know, inverted wingers, inside forwards, cutting in. So you have Lancaster on the right, cutting on his left foot. Sears on the uh, on the left, cutting in on his right foot. I just think they're they're clever footballers. They now have to find space. Sears has got a very good record at this level, and he's looking looking sharp uh, after he came back after his injury. And uh, as Joe said, Lancaster plays with no fear. He's uh, he's got that quality on his left foot, and his, his delivery, as we saw yesterday, could be superb. Who's your pick, Joe? Um, difficult because I, I I think Lancaster's going to be eased back a little bit that he's not going to just come in and play every game. But but Guion Edwards has started the season really well mm-hmm. and he's looking sharp and looking like he's got goals in him. So I think between sort of I, at the moment I'd probably go one of Sears or Lancaster and one of Edwards or Judge just to give us a little bit of a balance with. But I think Judge is going to struggle to sort of stay in the team when you look at the quality that sort of Edwards, Sears, and Lancaster are producing between them. So I think we. we We've got good options there, and we've got a, we've got a, a different variety of options as well. So, hopefully, sort of horses for courses, and whoever's playing well stays in the side. Well, maybe maybe Judge becomes a rotation option for Dazel, perhaps, or Bishop in central mid. Um, my favourite tactic, and this this is what I'd go for: Sears and Edwards, um, because you can play them as um, cutting in wingers or orthodox wingers, and that's my old football manager favourite is to switch those around when it's clearly not working. Um, let's do it. We've we've talked about the strike squad a bit. Like Dom Keeble's was question. Um, don't think Norwood offered a huge amount again today. Starting to lean towards Hawkins if we assist on the solo man up top. Um, how did Tranmere get the most out of him? I think he had someone just behind him, didn't he? Seb, I think he it wasn't. Yeah, I think it was Jennings, wasn't it? In a four-two-three-one, just behind him in the number ten role. So. You sort of got to get used to, to not having that that immediate support. The support's going to come from the from the wide positions or the midfielder breaking late. He's not going to have that constant number ten to to, to help him out. So so Dom Keeble's question, Dom's question is: um, Should we be looking to replicate that that setup? Um, as Norwich are any real goal scoring striker? 
Well, the four-two-three-one is pretty flexible. You know, you know, you can just push Nolan slightly further forward. Judge can play in that role. You've got the likes of El Mazzuni, Dobra. So the, the 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 options are there to to get him some support. But I think the way we're looking at the moment, the support needs to come from the the two wide players. Norwood is still, in my opinion, our best our best bet at the at the top of the pitch, and he needs those wide players to sort of help him out. Are they, are they good enough starters? Jacob Howley's question: Are they good enough, or do we need to bring someone in? Or, or as I alluded to at the start. Give Jackson a go, maybe. You know what could go wrong with there, but giving Jackson a chance with pace as well. Go on, yeah, I, I mean, just don't think that Jackson suits that role through the middle. In this is a team that needs to hold up the ball, and the striker needs to be able to drop in and play and come back and sort of get things going and hold the ball up, which isn't his game at all. It's a it's a back to goal role, which Drynan has shown, which Hawkins seems to be able to play. I, I sort of my worry is. With Hawkins, that I, I sort of put it in the Faber WhatsApp group, he just does not look like he's got a goal in him. He just looks so indecisive around the box, and then he has that chance, and then he doesn't even hit the target. And that is that should be his bread and butter, that header within the six-yard box. But I don't know. I, I, I don't think he's going to score as many goals, and it means you're then relying heavily on Sears, Edwards, Lancaster, Nolan to all get your 10, 12 goals, which is a big, big ask. But I don't know. It, it, it's... It's still all up for grabs now. It's just a real shame that Dryden's injured that we aren't so we are having to rush these guys back into the side where maybe they're not quite ready for it. Would you get a loan in, guys? Would you, or, uh, uh, we're not going to pay money for it unless we sell one of Jackson or someone. So yeah, but personally, I, I'd say if we could if we could get a decent fee for Jackson, I'd probably take it. And if we can reinvest that within the sort of confines of the salary cap then yeah I, I would I would be looking to do that I think we need someone more suited to the role than than Jackson is and if he's a valuable asset then do that we need a Matty God and like Cobb signed but um and and Seb Harry Butcher um do we honestly need, actually need any more signings is his question is there any er, er, anywhere else on the pitch where you'd strengthen or is it just this kind of front man Position. Now, assuming assuming the injured players come back in, I, I've still got a bit of a worry about the right back situation. Uh, Chambers has started the season really, really well, um, but he is going to turn 35 soon, so I'm not sure he'll be able to bomb up and down the uh, the flanks for an entire season. But uh, assuming that Kane Vincent Young comes back in pretty quickly, uh, I would just still look maybe a maybe a loan from a you know a, a Premier League side, sort of a, a, a youngish kind of player who can play that that holding the ball up role. And and just a quick one, Seb as well. Andy Andy Gray, not that one. Um, says when Kane Vincent Young returns, who does he replace, like for like, or does Chambers go back into the centre back role? Uh, I think Chambers goes back into the centre back role. I, I still think Chambers and Wolfenden are our best two centre halves, uh, with Ward on the left and KV1 on the on the on the right. But that that would be very very harsh on Toto and Wilson. I do I do appreciate that. Mm. Um, Joe Stubbsy says as good as Nolan played, and he did. I actually think that Flynn Downs looked quite classy when he came on. Can we afford to leave him out of the starting eleven against stronger opposition? I think he I think Flynn has done his case sort of no end of good with his performance when he came on yesterday. And I think he's he's come back in, he's shown the right attitude and ultimately he was by a mile our best midfield player last year. And we need we need to find a way to get back in the team. It's it's just been a case of working out where he's going to come back in the team. But it looks I'd say from yesterday's evidence that Dazelle sitting at the sort of um, base of the sort of three with Downs and Nolan in front. They seem to have a really nice balance there. And Bishop started the season well, but Nolan started even better. So I think at the moment that's that's how it needs to be. But I think Dazelle is nailed on because he's the only player that can get us playing like he is. And I think Downs is nailed on. So we're talking of either Nolan or Bishop for that other role. And I say Nolan is the man for me at the moment in possession. Yeah, a lot of people, and Andrew and... Pete Gerling sort of saying, who does Downs get in ahead of? And, and Sally for, for Teddy Bishop, if it's going to happen, it does feel, yeah, Andrew's suggestion is do you drop Bish? So I think that's what maybe we're suggesting. But I mean, would you, would you, would you, is Downs that important that you'd make that change, Seb? I think so, yeah. He's our he's our best player by a mile. You saw yesterday when he came on that, that extra bit of quality that then gives other players licenses to to get further forward in Nolan's case or to put his foot on the ball in, uh, in Dizelle's case. Uh, Bishop started the season very, very well, but I, I would look to bring that midfield three on Saturday as being Dizelle, Nolan and down. Just just quickly, Seb, on, on Dizelle. This is an interesting question from Paul. Is there a realistic chance of keeping Dizelle if he continues to play the way he is now? Or have we missed out on the chance of receiving a huge fee by not giving him a chance to play over the last couple of years and presumably giving him a longer-term deal? 
Yeah, I guess this is the concern that he has a, an absolutely storming season. Someone comes in and snaps him up either for a, a low fee in January or a tribunal kind of fee at the end of the season. I mean, he's he's making the right noises. He said he's just become a, a new dad, hasn't he? So you'd like to think hopefully he's settled in Suffolk and wants to stay here. Uh, it appears that, that Jason is quite a big influence on him as well. So that could go in our favour. But, you know, if you're if you're Marcus Evans and you've seen how he started the season, you'd be wanting to, to get on the phone to his agent ASAP to get a longer term deal sort of sorted out. Even if it's one like we used to do with Wickham and Creswell. Do you remember, we'd, we'd offer them like three year deals and the following summer they'd be sold, you know, at least to, to protect the asset a little bit rather than risk losing one of our, our key players for, for virtually nothing. Are you hearing any whispers, Joe, about deals for Dizel? I think it's... Uh... It's a situation that the only way he's going to sign a new deal is if he stays in the team and plays every week because he's been here long enough and not had that run. So, But I think if, he, if he's going to play every week, then I think he'll stay. He's, we're giving him a opportunity to showcase himself in his best role as a deeper line playmaker. But if he stays in the team and we stay towards the top of the league, then I, I think he'll stay. But there's a lot of factors that need to go into that. Long way to go. But it's a... It's, but like I say, he, he said he's just had a kid. I, I assume his girlfriend is local and they've got sort of family support here and that, that goes a long way when you've got children. And unless it's a sort of silly offer from someone, I think I think we're, we're at, at the moment, we're in the driving, sort of the driving seat to get him here next year. If all things being equal, Ips, him staying at Ipswich or him going anywhere else, I'd say you'd take Ipswich rather than the field at this point. Yeah. Um, and let's, let's end on this one. Um... And I'm, <laughs> I'm going to deliberately pitch it to Joe because I'm sure if Ben was hosting, he'd pitch this one to, to Joe or me anyway. Um, Mikey um, are um, from the pod team, an agreeable starting 11, patient approach and a well-timed and impactful substitute. Are there signs that Lambert could be getting his mojo back? And let me just add into the mix as well um, this question as well, Joe. I'm just watching you squirm in your seat on this one. Tom Dixon, can we please give Lambert a touch of credit? Started with the right team, made the right changes at the right time and got the right result. Tough love approach seems to be working. Do you concur? Yeah, the um I'd say I know I've been critical of Lamb very critical of him, but the, the things that I've been critical of are chopping and changing the team, chopping and changing the shape. Um and they're two things that he just has not done this year. He has not wavered from how he wants us to play, and we are playing good football and we are doing the right things. Yesterday, the subs, all three subs came on and made a difference as opposed to last season where it seemed to be the game just drifted and drifted and drifted away from us. And then we'd make a change at 85, 86 minutes. And it's like that change needed to be earlier to give them a chance. And yeah, it it does seem so far that he's, well, so far he's got everything right as far as I'm concerned. And if I can keep coming on here and saying that every week, I'll be happier than anyone, trust me. We we will both enjoy eating the humble pie. That will taste very sweet if we get top six at least um let's finish on on some positive let's continue the air of positivity seb um before i say it's only bloody september and we've only played <laughs> two league games against lesser opposition um dave gore everyone in this league is lesser opposition that's the way we should be thinking uh, dave gore this bench right here is why we should be at the top of the table and we're missing vincent young wolfie judge jackson from the 18 we can bring on players most of the league can't with dobra and Il Mazzuni hopefully getting um, a few months of decent football as well. Um, where's FPL Tractor? I know he said something that I wanted to read out. Um, does this good start have a more solid feel or am I just getting overexcited? And um, just to finish off, because we always love to... Um, t- 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 uh, mouth 11, um, 200 goals and 200 points is possible, right? Are you feeling <laughs> positive, Seb? I am, yeah. I mean, 200 I points. a bit nervous going into the season. 200 points is a little bit optimistic. I'll settle for... I'll sell for 100 points and 100 goals. Um, but no, going into the season, we were a little bit concerned. You know, you're hearing the stories that Lambert's giving tough love and it might not be going down very well. But as Joe said, at this point, you've got, you've got to give him credit. You know, he's, he's delivering at the moment. Uh, bigger tests are to come, but you can only beat what's in front of you. And we've, you know, played two, one, two, two clean sheets in the league. It's, it's all looking very good at the minute. Long may it continue. Yeah, we were top of the league and clear in November, by the way. But last year, but that's fine. I'll just... Um... Temper that. Is. Temper that. Yeah. There you go. Bring you all back down to earth. Um, 
thanks for the questions a lot that kind of echo similar themes there so apologies if i didn't read them out but thank you as always for those it's really useful for um for driving the debate forward um let's do a roundup let's talk about the uh, lesser opposition that we have in league one joe um entertainment was at loftus road yesterday i, I wasn't aware that um, afc wimbledon are playing at loftus road um but that is where they are playing while their stadium is being built um if only we'd been well i guess a lot of people like to tick off the ground but it's irrelevant now isn't it because it's it won't be um it won't be there next year. And um, Wimbledon four, Plymouth four, some really nice goals in this game. Um Cooper, Connor Grant, is that the I think that might be the ex Loney Connor Grant. Yeah. yeah. Um yeah. Piggott free kick of this one and but Plymouth come back from four two down to to draw for all. Some pretty lousy defending in here as you'd expect. Shane, Shane McLaughlin scored ex ITFC as well. Shane so. McLaughlin for Wimbledon? No. Yep. Yeah. Didn't yeah. spot that one. There you go. Um chip in as as you want on these ones, by the way, but yeah. Um um, Blackpool 2 Swindon nil. so early pace set to Swindon back down to earth with a bump um, I just wanted to um, query this um, Blackpool one of the teams to have a thousand odd supporters in yesterday um, is this going to give home advantage um, now and kind of maybe destabilise a little bit of op oppositions that now have to have only got home support to play in front of I don't think so, really. A thousand fans can't make much noise unless they, unless it's a thousand of like Millwall's lot from behind the goal that stand <laughs> there and, and sort, sort one end. But I don't, I don't really see that a thousand fans in the ground is going to make a huge amount of difference. Interestingly, I was listening to a podcast earlier where they spoke to the Shrewsbury chief executive and basically the the EFL sent an email out on Monday morning saying we're looking for eight teams to be just sort of take a thousand fans in on the test event and it was like you had to come back to them by one o'clock that day by that time you needed to have confirmed with like your safety team which means getting the okay from the police the fire service the sort of ambulance service that you your stewards that you could get this sorted you can get it in place you can get the tickets printed out and delivered out to your guys in it so it was a real they, they said true should we manage to get it done but they, they also said that they a they were able to they had a number of other teams that said, look, we'd love to, but we just cannot get this all sorted today. So it does seem like the teams that were able to get it done and did very well and hope, hopefully we'll be one of the teams that can get it done for next week. I was going to say, I think we're, we're keen, aren't we? So fingers crossed on that one. Let's talk about Shrewsbury because it immediately debunks the um, argument that I've set out that home advantage might be a thing because Shrewsbury actually lost 2-1 to Northampton um, and an absolute howl. I think they've got a keeper on loan from Villa. Um, Shrewsbury absolutely howler and he gives the ball to um, Hoskins, I think, who's, who wins the game for Northampton. Um, Burton 2-1 winners over Acton. First points for Jake Buxton, who's in charge there now. Um, Charlton, though, really schizophrenic. Again, Doncaster, who, who are probably under... Um, ah, the ex-West Brom boss. Who Darren, Moore. Darren Moore. Thank you, bloody hell. No, it's didn't extend far enough to the manager names. Um, good win for them. Ja um, John Jules with a good goal. We know about him. He scored for... Did he score against us for Lincoln or Blackpool? I'm trying to remember. Lincoln, I think it was. Um, although he's walking through statuesque defending, it's not. Um, and I don't know what's what's the deal with Charlton this season. Are they still off the field issues there? There's still there's still a very real chance they could be wound up. I think yeah. that their their ownership Owners is an absolute is, yeah. mess. Yeah. Um, MK Dons one Lincoln two. So um, Craig and, and my um, dark horse pick Lincoln. Um, continue their 100% record in the league as well everyone else's dark horse pick is it okay fine well I'm I thought I was special but thanks Joe um <laughs> Oxford nil Sunderland two I'm going to put this out there I think Oxford are going to uh, not go, I, but I think uh, what am I going to say with Oxford bottom half finish for Oxford they lose to Sunderland um uh, <laughs> Sunderland fans because Oxford's only got three sides to their ground uh, there were Sunderland fans who drove the 500 odd mile round trip to stand on top of the vans and watch that fixture um, testing their eyesight. Testing their eyesight. Um, <laughs> posh. Um, this is a smash and grab. Fleetwood, I think, had gone, had won their last four matches in all competitions. Um, and, um, yeah, two goals in injury time from Jack Taylor and Sammy Smodic. Um, give them the points here, their first win of the season. Um, Wigan in all kinds of trouble. Two, Gillingham, three. A double four, ex Loney Jordan Graham. Remember him. Um, and finally, um, Rochdale nil, Pompey nil, two nil nil draws, and a four nil defeat in the Carabao Cup midweek to Brighton for Pompey. Kenny Jacket, do we think is he first up for the P forty fives? Be under a lot of pressure. He was under a lot of pressure before the season even began. 
didn't they start really slowly last year? I'm sure we we did a, yeah. a pod. I think it was Fleetwood, wasn't it, last year around November, October time. And they were in a similar position. They were starting really slowly, but they seemed to find their groove and just surged up the table. So I think we're about 17 points ahead of them at one stage. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, yeah, so there's, there's the context for your questions, guys. That's 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 how, you, how Ipswich um, generally get on after a good start. Um, so, but, but, sorry, just, just quickly, with the, with the round-up there, we... We sort of oh, we're saying how poor Bristol Rovers are. Well, obviously we beat them. Bristol Rovers then go away to Sunderland to pick up a point up there. Sunderland then go away to Oxford and beat them. I know it is a topsy turvy league and one result doesn't mean another, but they're clearly no mugs in the sort of <laughs> Mick McCarthy term. And <laughs> I'd say that they're a team that they're a team that's hard to break down. And we've managed to score five goals and create countless chances against them over two games. So yeah. okay, look for cool. positives. Um, so. Um, th- I think this is the only context where I can use this word now, but Ipswich, the top of the embryonic League One table, um, full points, full points from their fixtures so far. Um, Lincoln and Hull just behind on goal difference, having done exactly the same. Donny on four points, along with Sunderland, Plymouth and Northampton. Um, and down the bottom, unsurprisingly, I guess, um, Wigan and Crew, but bottom, rock bottom, by one goal, Oxford United. Um that's the roundup, guys. Anything more to add on League One business? No. Shaking of heads. That's what we want. We're bang on time. Next up, Rochdale, Joe. Is this another team we should be beating? Hashtag winnable. Yes. yes. I think at home. I think Rochdale are a team that play such a specific brand of football and they are dogmatic to it of playing out from the back. They they do just try and play out from the back and with what we've got in midfield and with what we've got up front, you just think we're going to be able to press the life out of them. Our pressing has looked on point this year at times, and you'd like to think we can just sort of press them, win the ball back, and hurt them with a bit more quality. And I say I'll be I'll be going into that game expecting to win it. So we um we we saw Rochdale. Do you remember before COVID there was football and stuff? Yeah, it was amazing. Um, and that was a was that a one nil victory for Ipswich? Yeah, fireworks. Danny fire, Rowe. Danny Rowe, of course. The yeah. yeah, Danny Rowe. Um, so, yeah, it's a nil-nil draw for Rochdale today against Pompey. And um, they lost to Sheffield Wednesday in the Carabao Cup and got beat by Swindon last week, 3-1 as well. Um, are you are you confident on this one as well? Uh, Ian Henderson yeah. was the, the main man there. He's now at Salford. Um, I'm yeah, trying to think who's the main players there. I don't know. I, I think we'll I think we'll win this one. You know, we've, we've been... Gifted quite an easy start on the fixtures. We don't really play anybody of note until Charlton, which is the the 10th of October, around about that kind of time. So we need to make the most of this early season. Confidence will be high now. Um, we finally got a, what we think is a, a, a pattern of play and a settled formation. So I think we'll win that one and then we can uh, the confidence can grow even further. Yep. Yeah. Um, and fingers crossed, fans in the ground. Um, and if you get a ticket, make sure you behave yourself and do all that face space whatever it is, nonsense, and yeah, don't muck it up for us. Um, guys, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate that. Where can we find you on Twitter, Seb? Uh, at BrownS08. And Joe, all of your bits and pieces, you got two? Yeah, at Joe Fairs and at ITFC underscore Academy. Was there a Mill- that, game against Millwall? Or yeah, that- the under-18s beat Millwall 2-1 yesterday, but apparently, there's no spectators allowed in the ground at the moment, or so it's behind closed doors, but apparently Ipswich had a penalty and two of the players took so long arguing over who was going to take the penalty that Millwall were awarded a free kick. I really, no way. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that was the rule. No, I've, I've never ever seen it before and it's only what I've been told by one of, sort of, via one of the players, so sometimes their stories aren't as accurate as you'd hope, but right. this one sounds like it might be. Who's in charge of the under-18s? Um, Adam Atte. Okay, surely he'd be kicking some arses yeah, after I imagine that. if this is the case, he will not be very happy. No. Um, and Joe, this was an opportune moment. I don't know whether you've forgotten this, but I certainly haven't. Who did you spot in Nando's? It was my boy, Dobbs. Dobbs. Did you <laughs> give him a socially distanced greeting of some kind? Yeah, just a fist bump and an elbow tap. Nice. Very good. Um, I did, I did. Just to no, pull you... out for the record. Yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got a bit of a cold, haven't you? As well, so I'm sure. I'm hoping you're staying well away from it. Um, yeah. What I was going to say as well. Um, yeah, I'm. Did, if you got Dobra, if you, if you, if anyone on uh, listening found that one, then give us a tweet, tweet Joe, and say I knew it was Dobra. Um, I d- there's nothing for, a stake for it, but apart from a warm, fuzzy feeling of being right, right. which is always nice. Um, in terms of other bits and pieces for the week, you can find um, you can find me at Ipswich if you care, um, which is where you'll find the links for the Torpedo Moscow highlights if they're still there. Um, 
no game this week, as Seb has mentioned. So um, good chance that we'll do another Q&A live stream, which seems to have gone down well before. Um, I think probably a good chance that Joe or I or Ben, definitely Ben, I think, will be involved in that one. So um, more details nearer the time um, and get your questions in for that. And then back as usual for the main show, the main pod. Um, I think Ben's got the hosting duties next week and the lineup is TBC. So um yeah, no consistency with our selections by the, by the look of it, but you never know. Um, that's it. You can subscribe to us in the usual places, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter. Um, and if you want to donate to the channel as well, there's details on our on the adverts. Um, and you can also find the links on our Twitter as well. That's, that's the end. Um, apart from um, a few edits which I need to do because you guys have got crap internet, I'm pretty certain we're bang on an hour, so I'm happy with that. Um, who wants the final word? Give it a joke. Um, keep it up, Lambert. Stop. Keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs>